with Waterlogged. Today, we are going to talk about triggerfish. Okay, before we get too far into talking about some of the common triggers that you might see at your local fish store or online, I want you to be mindful of two things. One, of all of the groups of fish that I've talked about so far, triggers are probably one of the largest ones that are kept on a regular basis. And with large fish, means you're gonna need a large tank. Even as juveniles, some of these guys can grow very, very fast. So I recommend if you're thinking about a trigger, go ahead, bite the bullet, get yourself a big tank. You don't have to upgrade later. The second thing is that most of the triggers on this list, and I'll make note of it on the whiteboard, are not reef safe. So there's a couple species that are reef safe um, if you make sure to feed them a lot, but they're only considered to be reef safe with caution. So you always wanna make sure you do your research before you commit yourself to buying one of these guys. They do have personalities, so I would hate for you to get one, fall in love with it, and then be out a coral tank. So let's go ahead and get started with some of the different species that you might see. First off is the blue trigger. Sometimes they're called the blue jaw or the blue chin trigger. <laughs> Tongue twisters there. Now they are the smallest ones on our list and they are actually reef safe with caution, with caution. <laughs> Next is a comical character, the clown trigger. Now they are second largest triggers on this list. Um, they're gonna be about a foot and eight inches in length. So they're fairly, fairly large, means they're gonna need a big system. Now they can be fairly aggressive. So again, always be mindful and do your research to see who you pair them up with. Next is our crosshatch trigger. Now of all of the triggers that I've known people to keep, this is the most common one that I see kept in pairs. Now what's really cool is you can actually tell the males from the females and that the males are going to have a yellower body versus the females. Now they are another one that is reef safe with caution, so maybe something to consider. Next is the Durgeon Trigger. Now, these guys, in addition to a bunch of the other ones on this list, actually will spend a lot of time messing around with rock work. So when you are rockscaping your tank, and I'll talk a little bit about this later, maybe include some smaller rocks that uh, they can push around and play with. Next is the Humu Humu trigger, or sometimes called the Picasso trigger. Now, they do get big, but they are one of the bigger triggers that are a little bit more peaceful in nature. So um, maybe consider that when picking out other tank mates. Next is going to be the Niger trigger. Now they are another one that is reef safe with caution. And something that's really cool about these guys is that depending on the lighting that they're in, some of their colors, they can look a dark navy blue, or if they have other different kind of lighting, they might have some bright sky, vibrant blue colors. So something interesting to think about, maybe mess with your lighting if you get one of them and see if you can't get some of those other colors to pop and shine. Next, we have the undulated trigger. These guys are probably one of my favorite triggers. A lot of times you see them when they're smaller, maybe about this size, um, fun personalities. They might be a little bit shy when you first add them to the tank, but as they get comfortable, this isn't even as they age, within a couple weeks of them getting comfortable, they will come right up to you. They are not afraid of anything. I've been bit by these multiple times, so uh, one to use caution with if you are feeding your tank by hand. Next is another one that is reef safe with caution and that's the pink tail trigger. Now something that's cool about this and this is another thing that fits into a lot of these different triggers is that they will make grunting noises. So you don't necessarily hear it that often but if you've got a quiet moment in the tank you might hear some small little grunting noises and that is definitely coming from those triggers. It's pretty cool if you actually get to hear this. All right, our last trigger on the list is the queen trigger. It's last because she is, or he, they are the biggest ones that you are going to commonly find. They're the biggest, the boldest, some of the most aggressive. They're gonna get to about two feet in length. And as you can guess, they're gonna need a fairly sizable tank. So with those two foot long queen triggers, you're gonna need at least 500 gallons, if not more, when you are thinking about getting a tank for them. Now the other large trigger on this list, that clown trigger that I mentioned, it's not quite gonna get two feet, but it will get fairly large at one foot and eight inches in length approximately. So you'll need at least a 300 gallon tank minimum for a clown trigger if you're considering one of those. 
especially as they get older. Now the rest of the triggers on this list are going to be anywhere between nine inches and just over a foot in length. And I would recommend about 180 gallon minimum size tank to keep them in, especially as they grow. Like I said, they do grow fairly fast. So might as well just go ahead, get yourself a large tank. That way they can just grow into it. All right, let's go to the kitchen and talk about some of the diet and nutritional needs that your triggers need. You may have guessed are carnivores, which means they're gonna need to eat a lot of meaty, chunky foods. Even when they're young, they're still gonna be eating a lot of those big, pieces of meat in addition to some veggies. So as always, we're going to break things down into different categories. We have our dry foods, our DIY foods, our frozen foods, and of course, some of our specialty foods. Now, just the way that triggers eat, the amount of food that they need, I'm going to recommend that you steer clear of flake foods. Not that there's anything wrong with them, it's just not necessarily an efficient way for them to get the nutrition that they need. So if you wanna feed a dry food, I would recommend sticking with pellets. I really like the New Wave Spectrum Probiotics Blend. They also have one that's a marine formula. And what's great about this line is that they come in a bunch of different pellet sizes, so you can get some of those jumbo pellets if you do have larger triggers in your tank that would be a good option for them. Moving on to our DIY foods, we have the Dr. Tim's Beneficial Fish Food. I really like this one because not only does it allow you to mix and make your own foods, but you can also add medications in there if you need. And in addition to medication, you can add um, some bits of shelled shrimp and other meaty foods with some crunchy bits for them to eat. So it's just a fun way to further interact with your fish or treat them with medication if you need to. Like I said, our first two categories are pretty small, so we're gonna move on to the frozen foods. Now, I feel like this is where a lot of your triggers food is going to come from. So first off, we have the Rod's Food Predator Blend. This one, as you can see, has a bunch of large, chunky, meaty bits for them, including some of those shrimp, and it even has some little bits of nori in there. So. That is one option. The next option is that you can go for a bunch of different types of individual seafoods. For example, if you have some of the triggers that are still a little bit younger, those juveniles, you might try feeding them some krill. It's got a little bits of that uh, shell still on it and it makes it really crunchy. Another thing that you can feed them is some silver sides or smelt if you can find them at your local fish store. I like this because it has the bone in and we'll talk a little bit about the bone in and shell on why that's important in a little min minute. Next, you could get some of the clams. If you can find mussels, those are another good option. Now, you can go to your local grocery store and look for some of this stuff in the frozen section. If you do though, make sure that you read the label. You don't want it to have any additives in there. So if it's got garlic or butter, steer clear of buying those sort of things. And if you're gonna get shrimp, try and get the shrimp that still has the shell on. Now, when I go and I buy frozen food at my local store, I like to go to Trader Joe's. This is one of the blends that I personally use in my tanks. It's got a blend of shrimp, squid, and scallops in there, so it has a nice variety of food. And it's only $7.99, so the pack will last you a long while. Now, that's it for the frozen foods. Let's move on to some of those specialty foods. Now, I know I said that triggers are carnivores, so they're primarily going to eat the meats, but you should occasionally offer them some veggies. So different types of nori are good. Now, you can see this rods blend. It has some of the shredded nori in there. You can use that. Some of the other fish, if you have them in the tank, might pick at that, but I would recommend sticking to those nori seaweed sheets so you can get them in a bunch of different colors, the purple, red, and even green, something good to add to your tank and to supplement their diet. Let's go ahead and talk about some of the issues that your triggers might face. Okay, now overall, triggers are a fairly hardy group of fish. Even for beginners, they're a really good option if you are looking to keep a fun, charismatic fish, but that's not to say that they don't have some of their issues. So one of the first things, and this is a specific characteristic to trigger, they have on their dorsal fin, they have a spine that's really rigid, and if they get scared or threatened, their defense mechanism is to shoot those spines out, and it allows them to wedge themselves 
themselves into the rock work, making it near impossible to get them out. So if you are watching and observing your tank and you see your trigger doing this behavior, it looks like it's wedged or stuck in a rock, leave it alone. For whatever reason, there was some sort of environmental response that triggered it to wedge itself in between those rocks. Give it some time, eventually that will pass and they will be out and swimming around in no time. So don't fret if you see that behavior. The next thing is another behavior that they do is spitting water. Now, a lot of times this is a learned behavior. They use it to get people's attention and it's not a big deal if you've got a lid covering your tank and a protection between your lights, but sometimes they can spit water with some serious range. And I've heard of them actually shorting out power strips, ruining lights because they're spitting water. So if you do encourage them to spit water, make sure you got a tank lit on there to protect any of your electrical equipment. The biggest thing when it comes to triggers that you need to worry about though is their teeth. So sort of like pufferfish, you have to feed them foods that have crunchy hard shells or bones in. And the reason for this is that it helps to keep their teeth filed down and at a manageable um, level for them to thrive in the aquarium. If not, you might have to take them out and work on trimming those teeth down. And let me tell you, it is not a pleasant experience. So go ahead and feed them a lot of hard, crunchy foods. Um, if you can get the clams in the shell or muscle with the shell or even some oysters that allows them to bite through those shells it will help to keep them in check now another thing that you can do and this sort of plays into enrichment I mentioned in the kitchen that you can feed them bits of nori so when you're feeding them nori if you don't have a nori clip you could use things like rock work or if you have some dead corals um, you can wrap the nori around there and as they eat it, they will crunch down on that and they will get some of the rock work in addition to some of that nori and help to keep their teeth in line. Now, another thing when it comes to enrichment, and I always love to use food and changing up their foods. I gave you a huge variety of different things that they can eat. So switching up the different types of foods that you give them on even a weekly basis is a fun way to add enrichment. The next thing that you can do to add enrichment to their lives is training them. They're a very charismatic, very curious group of fish, and it doesn't take much to train them. I've actually known people who have trained triggers that when they go into feed, the trigger kind of hangs out on its side and will even right, rotate and fl do little flips in the water. So really intelligent group of fish if you want to dedicate some of that time to training them, and it'll be a fun challenge for them as well. Now, early I mentioned, mentioned that rock work is really important for triggers. And in addition to the generalized rock scape that you should have for them, because they do like to hang out around the rock work. I mentioned that it's a place for them to hide and feel safe. They also like to play and move rocks around. So consider having some smaller trigger sized pieces of rocks that they can move and push around and redecorate as they so choose. Now, another method of enrichment, of course, is tank mates, right? So triggers are one of the bolder, more aggressive groups of fish, and they don't necessarily get along with lots of community fish, especially the smaller ones. But good options might be for you to keep them with, say, puffer fish or lionfish, groupers, maybe even eels, fish that have similar manners and similar aggression levels. Now, one thing to note is even if you have a really, really large tank, I would not put two males together. Now, you can have one male and some females if you have a mated pair, but avoid putting those males together because they will get very aggressive and it's just not going to be a pretty thing. But if you are curious about fish that I didn't mention, go online, look up the saltwater fish compatibility chart. You can figure out what fish you're thinking about putting together with them and see if they will match. As always, make sure you do your research before you buy or add anything to your tank. And thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you next time.